about uh, Egypt State TV going uh, even beyond propaganda and just being an arm of the executive branch. That I think that's exactly right. Mm. Um, we are getting uh, many comments, questions on Facebook. Uh, thousands are watching us at democracynow.org and on the satellite networks, uh, Link TV and Free Speech TV. Michelle Kumi Baer just posted this question on Facebook. Anjali, um, she's asking, what's the role of women in the revolution? Why aren't we seeing more of their voices and faces in mainstream media? I think Democracy Now! is showing more women than I see anywhere else in the networks, perhaps combined, you know, really articulating what's happening in Tahrir Square and other places. Anjali, are you there? Can you hear me, Amy? Yes. I, was, I just said that Tahrir Square has thousands of women and children. It's not just a male space. Um, and it's got men, women, and children from all classes of Egyptian society. It's not dominated by any single class. Um, and it's very inspiring to see people from a variety of social strata interacting with each other, trying to discuss with each other how to work with each other to build a new political future for themselves and their country. Um, as to why there aren't more women, Egyptian women's voices being seen in the mainstream media, I can't really speak to that, but I've certainly spoken to a number of women over the past few days, um, and all of them have been very strong in their opposition to Hosni Mubarak, very strong in their opposition to the entire regime. And, you know, their grievances with the regime range from, you know, unemployment, uh, lack of opportunity to advance in their lives, lack of freedom, um, having family members who've been tortured, um, who've been harassed, um, and just wanting to taste freedom for the first time in their lives. Sharif, you've been speaking to many women. I'm going to see if we have a clip of the one of the women who you spoke to in Tahrir Square who really has a message for President Obama. Do you have any a message to uh, the Obama administration? Yes, I have a message to the Obama administration, which is on behalf of all the people that are being killed here, stop addressing Mubarak like he's a valid person who would find a solution. We don't want a solution from Mubarak. Mubarak will not find a solution. And it's outrageous that you still talk about him as if he should sit and talk. He should not sit and talk. Anjali Comet, um, continue there. And also talk about what it's like to walk around outside Tahrir Square. Do you feel the atmosphere is changing? Do you think there's a kind of closing in that's going on? I mean, Cairo is really now split into Tahrir Square and the rest of, of Cairo is what it seems like to me. Um, and while, you know, the, the curfew hours have been eased in the days since I've gotten here, the day I got here, um, curfew began at 1 p.m., whereas today it just began at 7 p.m. Um, and nobody in Tahrir, obviously, is, um, you know, following the curfew. It's absurd to even call it a curfew because the square is overflowing with people um, at all times of day and night. But outside Tahrir, during curfew hours, it's very difficult to move around, um, particularly if you don't have a car. Um, walking through places, there is a sense of fear and intimidation being waged by the, 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 the thugs um, being unleashed by the state. Um, there's always a lot of rumors about thugs hanging out in different bridges, different pathways. So getting from one part of Cairo to, to the other can be very difficult. There's no public, very difficult to find public transportation um, during curfew hours. So walking back late at night has, has been a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, there's, uh, Sharif has talked about in previous broadcasts, that the popular committees, the neighborhood committees that have been set up in every neighborhood, um, you know, they're literally 50 to 100 yards Every 50 to 100 yards, there's a small group of men, usually, in certain areas of the city. There's also women um, with, with sticks, with, uh, with knives, with uh, rifles, shooting rifles, um, with flower pots, with really anything they can find to kind of guard their area. Um, and uh, for the most part, they're very polite and uh, apologetic about stopping and searching people. But in certain areas, it also, you know, I think this, this campaign of fear and intimidation by the state is, is having a very negative impact on people, and people are becoming very fearful and, and don't want any outsiders um, in, into their neighborhoods. Um, I mean, don't want, forget about foreigners, just nobody from a certain other a, a neighborhood of Cairo is allowed into their neighborhood. In certain areas, you're, if your ID card doesn't say you're from that neighborhood, it's very difficult to enter. So this makes it... Um, 
you know, a very different sort of Cairo than, than, than it was before. Um, it's also what it feels, you know, it, it feels like people are trying to take over police functions and maybe are becoming a little overzealous because of the government's propaganda fear. It's a complete contrast to the openness and freedom that one feels inside Bahrish Square. Anjali Kamet, just out of Tahrir Square. I wanted to ask Anjali, uh, before we move on, if while you were there today uh, in the square, Tahrir, which means liberation, were you getting these news reports that we have all sorts of conflicting reports that President Mubarak has signed, uh, resigned as head of the party and what the response was inside? Well, we just heard that he had resigned as head of the party, um, you know, which, which, you know, was not enough for people by any means. Um, and that's, that's just when I left the square. Um, but I, I didn't hear anything beyond that. Uh, Anjali, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, stay on, uh, and we'd like to hear other things that you have to say. We are joined now uh, from Stanford University by Joel Bynan. He's actually just returned from Israel, where he gathered material on a small but growing resistance movement composed of young Israelis and Palestinians dedicated to nonviolence. His parents also live in Israel. Um, Joel Bynan is professor of Middle East history at Stanford University, former director of Middle East studies at the American American University in Cairo, an author of several books on Egypt. Before we talk about what's happening in Israel and the occupied territories, Professor Bynan, uh, talk about your reaction to what's happening now in Egypt. This is absolutely thrilling. Uh, I can only join with uh, my friend and colleague uh, Rashid Khalidi's uh, comments, which uh, were on earlier, that uh, this has been a very, very long time coming. And it's a very great thing, and uh, I hope, along with him, that this spreads uh, far and wide throughout the Arab world as soon as possible. And I do want to add that Professor Rashid Khalidi is with us, and he's going to be joining us uh, in just a minute as we continue this discussion. But first, your thoughts on Egypt, Professor Bynan. I think one of the things that people haven't mentioned about Egypt, because there's been so much attention to the demonstration effect of events in Tunisia and also a lot of attention to the role of social media, is that there has been, for the last 10 years or more, a whole series of mobilizations around political issues, a support for the Palestinian uh, Intifada, which broke out in 2000, opposition to the American invasion of Iraq, a support for freedom of the judiciary in the spring of 2006. And most important of all, uh, since 1998, over 2 million workers have engaged in well over 3,000 strikes, sit-ins, and other forms of collaboration. Collective action. So this has been building up for 10 years. Various sectors of the population have learned that they don't have to be afraid of the security apparatus of the regime, which is indeed quite terrifying. Uh, but workers did win economic demands. People learned that if you struggle, you may in fact win something uh, worthwhile. The regime was prevented from repressing uh, collective actions by workers, as it routinely did in the 1980s and 90s, because it wanted to appear open and democratic to uh, foreign direct investment, which did, in fact, come in uh, in very large amounts uh, during the first decade of the 21st century. So I would uh, put a lot of emphasis on what people learned over the last decade as contributing not in a direct way that can easily be measured, but in an indirect and cumulative way to what's happening in the last 12 days in Egypt. Uh, Paul Amer is still on with us, uh, professor at University of California, Santa Barbara. Your comment on the issue of labor struggle that people aren't really focusing very much on um, when it comes to the beginnings of this massive uprising from January 25th. Uh, well, yes, just as uh, Professor Van <laughs> was uh, underlining, I think uh, people are forgetting that there was a national strike last year that. Uh, uh, that shut down the whole country. And then just the, I believe it's the day before or the day of when protests started, the first National Labor Federation was formed. And again, there's a huge um, shift in just the past years. There's been, I think, five or six free trade zones opened by Russia and Russian industries in Egypt, full of factories. There's a lot of Chinese investment coming in. There's been new military industries being set up in partnership with the military 
with Russian and Chinese and Kazakhstani investment. So um, there's really a new industrial and manufacturing base being built in Egypt, a global economy with, of course, terrible working conditions, but, however, creating a structure in which workers have been able to organize. In the informal economy, small shops that are funded with small microloans, there's been a lot of women's uh, protagonism and entrepreneurship there. However, these women are often facing um, kind of police operating as loan sharks. Since there's no collateral, banks usually don't go directly to these micro businesses. They kind of use the police to operate as loan sharks. So there's been women fighting the police then on a micro level as entrepreneurs, um, women and men. But uh, so there's new factories, there's new businesses uh, from the ground up that creates a different economic and social structure, a, a foundation for for tension and revolt, but also for really interesting organization. And also not the same old players. It's not the IMF, uh, the EU, and, and the United States, but these global uh, investors from Brazil, from Turkey, from China, from Russia, from Dubai. So that creates a whole new kind of dynamism. It's very interesting. Mm. We have to break. I want to thank Professor Amar, Paul Amar, Associate Professor in the Global International Studies Program at University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, we are continuing with Joel Bynan at Stanford University, just back from Israel, and with, uh, um, with Rashid Khalidi, uh, Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University. Uh, when we come back from break, we're going to go directly to Cairo to speak with Araf Suef, who is a well-known novelist, Egyptian novelist. She has been a regular at the Tahrir protests. Stay with us.